How come when Max Shrek does that, it looks all cool and badass and creepy and scary as hell? And when I do it, I just look constipated. Greetings, everyone. Well, another Halloween season is upon us, so this year we're going to be focusing on classic monsters. Yes, I'll be doing all the Universal Monster movies, as well as a lot of other movies based on those classic monsters, such as today's selection, Nosferatu from 1922, the silent horror classic. Let's talk about it today on Halloween month for the Multimedia Chronicles. Welcome back. Now, in preparation for this year's Halloween Fest, I actually read the novel, the original novel of Dracula, for the very first time ever. Yeah, I'd never actually read it before. It took a while to get through, to be honest. It's a little bit long-winded and dense, but damn, it was good. So one of the things I've been very curious about is to see just how accurate a lot of the various film versions are to the novel. What they leave out, what they change, what they, I don't know, expand upon, whatever. Whatever the case may be. I'd like to see, you know, I've been keeping an eye out to see just what changes and similarities there actually are. So that's one of the things that we'll be talking about over the course of these reviews. So Nosferatu is often credited as being the first on-screen appearance of Dracula, the first adaptation of Bram Stoker's novel. Um, and yes, technically it is the first adaptation, uh, the, well, the first screen adaptation anyway, of Bram Stoker's novel. There was a stage play done back when he was still alive. But it's actually not the first film appearance of Dracula. That would be this one. Dracula Halala, <laughs> which in English is Dracula's death. Now this one's kind of Dracula in name only, uh, but it predates Nosferatu by one year. It actually came out in 1921. It's a Hungarian film. Sadly lost. What you see here is All That Remains. Three fuzzy, low-resolution pictures and the movie poster. Um, also, the story was very much not the story of Dracula. It was basically about a young woman who is uh, put into an insane asylum and she meets an inmate there who claims to be Count Dracula. And it's kind of ambiguous, I guess, as to whether or not he is telling the truth or if he's just delusional. So it, it kind of sounds like... Uh, kind of reminiscent of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, actually, where did all of this stuff actually happen, or is the, the guy telling the story just crazy? Well, that's up to you to decide. So Nosferatu came out the following year, 1922, German film directed by F.W. Murnau, and, well, I gather uh, Mr. Murnau wanted to do a film version of Dracula, but... For whatever reason, he wasn't able to secure the rights. Maybe it was too expensive. Uh, uh, Bram Stoker's widow, Florence Stoker, was still alive, and the story was not yet in the public domain. It was, wasn't was even, you know, 50 years old at the time. So, unable to secure the rights, Murnau decided to do the movie anyway. <laughs> yep. He basically tried to skirt around the possible copyright infringement by changing the names of the characters and changing the story slightly and changing the ending from how the book ends. So Jonathan Harker is renamed Hutter, his fiancée Mina is renamed Ellen, and of course Dracula himself is renamed Count Orlock, played by the wonderfully creepy 
Max Shrek. So as the story starts off, it's uh, quite familiar, if you know the story of Dracula at all. It's very, very similar to how Dracula begins, where uh, Hutter goes to visit Count Orlok. Uh, he's warned by the, the terrified villagers against going to the castle and such. He said, well, I have to go. I'm here on business. So he goes and he meets with the Count, and he's basically a solicitor. He's there to sell him a house out in England. And, uh, well, the, the Count is very interested they sit and they have dinner and hutter cuts his finger oh this is one of the things we're going to mention by the way how does whoever the solicitor is in that particular movie cut himself thus um <laughs> igniting the bloodlust of dracula well in this one he's actually cutting a piece of bread and he gets distracted by the rather creepy cuckoo clock that the count has meanwhile the count is looking over the papers for the, uh, I guess the deed for the for the house that uh, Hutter's there to sell to him, and uh, Hutter ends up cutting his thumb. He's cutting the bread towards himself. I mean, the most dangerous possible way you can cut anything. He cuts it towards himself, and it cuts to like the knife just buried in his thumb and blood all over the place. It's actually quite gory for 1922. I imagine people were quite horrified with their delicate 1920s sensibilities and then of course orlock is like oh and kind of advances on him and then advances on him and hutter's backing away scared and then finally they end up in kind of the living room by the fireplace and they sit and they chat for a while about stuff he you know orlock kind of calms himself down you know from there it plays out very similar to the book where hutter uh you know experiences various terrors and horrors discovers orlock in his coffin and realizes, like, oh my god, the villagers were right, he's a vampire, and I just signed a, a, a house over to him that's right across from my house, and oh my god, what have I done? And, uh, and it plays out much like the book. Now, one thing I was really happy to see that they really focus on a lot in the movie is Orlok's trip on the boat over from... Well, it's not Transylvania either. It's somewhere else. They even renamed the locations. Like, yep, nope, totally different because it's a different place. Totally different. It's not Dracula. It's, it's, it's Orlokula. <laughs> anyway, so I was really happy to see that they had a, a big focus on the boat journey over because that's something that a lot of the movies kind of gloss over a little bit or don't really focus on too heavily. Whereas in the book, I thought it was a pretty exciting part of the book. There's it, it, The book, of course, is told in the form of journal entries and letters and things like that. Well, the arrival of the boat was told first in a... Uh, news story about the arrival of the boat, how it arrived just in this tumultuous storm and everybody thought it was going to crash into the docks, but it didn't. It actually ended up just somehow docking safely after just rocketing towards the, the shore. And then when they go onto the boat to check out the crew, there's no survivors. They only find the captain uh, tied to the wheel, dead. So then we find out through the captain's journals what actually happened was various crew members started mysteriously disappearing and fewer and fewer of them and they came to realize there was something on the ship that was killing them all and we as the viewer of course know that it's Orlok having some snacks on the journey over so he spent some time I guess with the uh, first mate who's down in the cargo hold with all of Orlok's black coffins of earth and he discovers Orlok, and that's where you get the iconic scene. He, he, he's basically opening all, all the coffins and trying to find, he suspects that whatever's killing them is in there, is like some kind of creature or something. Before he gets to the one that Orlok is in, the coffin lid opens by itself, and that's where you get the iconic scene of Orlok just rising straight up out of the coffin. That's quite a striking uh, 
uh, moment that, I mean, it's, it's, it's classic. It's just a classic cinematic moment. But I really liked the fact that they spent so much time focusing on the journey on the ship because that, that's a wonderful bit of claustrophobic horror. You know, I mean, they're stuck on this ship with something that's stalking them and killing them all. They have no idea what it is. All they know is they're dying, they're disappearing. So finally, the captain just ties himself to the wheel. He's like, I'm going to get this thing to its destination no matter what. Ties himself to the wheel so whatever, uh, even if he gets killed, he'll still be strapped to the wheel and his corpse can steer it. I don't know. Anyway, it was like seeing that moment from the book brought to life. It was actually quite exciting to see. Now, one of the things with Orlok versus Dracula is as he's coming over to England, he's not just bringing his own evil and death directly resultant from him killing people, but he's also bringing over plague. He is a, he's bringing rats with him, like thousands of rats with him. Uh, a lot of them are in the boxes of earth that he's, he's bringing with him. And so he's, he's not just bringing his own evil and his own directly causing death, but he's also bringing plague. So if you have a phobia of rats, you'll find a lot to be scared of in this. <laughs> it's a lot of shots of rats milling about and doing rat things. Um, and Orlok himself looks very rat-like. He has that sort of long nose and the, the, little, the little fangs in the middle instead of the, the usual uh, canine fangs that, that most vampires have. So it's quite a different kind of uh, look. Speaking of the look, actually, the, the look of Orlok has been very influential in vampire lore. Uh, for example, there was uh, Mr. Barlow from Salem's Lot was very much modeled after Orlok. Well, in the TV movie adaptation anyway. I don't think he was described quite that way in the book. And then also, of course, Vampire the Masquerade, the role-playing game, which I've talked about uh, a few times in the past. They had one of the clans, one of the vampire clans, was the Nosferatu clan, and they all looked very much like Count Orlok. So it's interesting to see how this, which started off essentially as a blatant ripoff slash copyright infringement of Dracula, has itself had its own influence on the legends and the lore. Now, speaking of which, something I should mention, a lot of people associate Death by Sunlight as one of the original key parts of vampire lore. Well, if you're one of the folks who thinks that, I've got a newsflash for you. You're actually wrong. The whole thing about sunlight being deadly to vampires came from Nosferatu. Now, in the book, they do mention sunlight. Sunlight weakens vampires, meaning, well, Van Helsing explains it himself. He says the vampire's powers are not as strong during the day. That's why, if we're going to defeat him, we have to catch him during the day. That's why the big chase at the end of the book is so exciting, is because they're racing against sundown. They've got to get to him before he gets back to his castle and get to him before the sun goes down, because then he'll be more powerful. So he says that when it's night, uh, a vampire may have the power of 20 men, whereas during the day, his powers are weakened. So sunlight is not deadly to Dracula, sunlight just weakens him. He's not at his best, so that's why he sleeps during the day. He obviously wants his powers to be at their peak so that he can't be easily defeated. So the whole concept of sunlight being fatal to vampires was actually introduced in Nosferatu. This is ground zero for that. This is where it started. So this is the first time ever in the history of vampire lore that a vampire was destroyed by exposure to sunlight. Pretty cool, eh? So speaking of Van Helsing and the boys hunting down Dracula, yeah, the Van Helsing character in this, um, as I was, it'd been a long time since I'd seen the movie, so it was, it was all kind of new to me all over again. But the Van Helsing character, I mean, there's a little bit of lead up with him. You see him teaching some students about different sort of uh, predatory creatures uh, in nature. And you think, oh, okay, this is, they're setting up the Van Helsing character and such, so he's going to, you know, come in and save the day, like he always does in every Dracula movie ever. Well, not this one. Uh, honestly, Van Helsing is kind of useless in this. He just doesn't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> 
who the real hero is in this is Ellen. Yeah, Hutter's fiance. So Hutter makes his way back from uh, from Dracula's camp. Dracula basically just abandons him there and takes off for England. So, um, well, I guess he's not going to England. He's going to like Germany. But anyway, this, they've changed the locations. I forget what they changed them to, but whatever. Anyway, we'll just call it England. Hutter follows him back, uh, kind of makes his way back, finally reunites with his uh, fiance. Uh, she is feeling the influence of Orlok, because Orlok's place that he got from Hutter is right across from their place. I mean, you can see it from the window. So she's feeling his influence, feeling his evil, feeling his presence, because one of the reasons Orlok wanted to go to England was because he he, he was, he, uh, well, I, I don't want to say smitten or attracted, because it's really not a love thing. It's more of a an animalistic attraction there's something about her that that appeals to him and he wants for himself so he wants her and she feels his influence pressing in upon her so when hutter returns she reads the book that he read all about vampires and everything and from that she comes to realize that orlok is a vampire and she kind of puts the pieces of the puzzle together that when he showed up so did the plague like the the town is completely stricken by plague shortly after orlok's arrival partly due to all the rats that he brought with him but also just you know his evil influence essentially she discovers that one way to defeat a vampire is for a woman who is innocent of virtue basically a virgin to offer her blood freely to the vampire to distract him from the rising sun or from the crow of the cock as they say yes they say cock in it meaning rooster i don't know what you were thinking ha <laughs> ha so she essentially sacrifices herself in order to save everybody because you know the van helsing character is useless hutter is powerless to stop him so she realizes it's all up to her so she sacrifices herself she allows she basically lures orlok to her place by opening her window and essentially inviting him and sacrifices herself to him and sure enough uh distracts him from the crow of the cock and um the sunlight destroys him the end <laughs> there you don't have to see the movie now no uh, there's going to be spoilers in all my reviews, by the way. I probably should mention that right off the top uh, because I'm going into detail and talking about a lot of specific things. So quite a different take on the story because most versions of the Dracula story have Van Helsing and the gang saving the day every time. But in this one, Van Helsing barely even figures into it. You see him in a few scenes and he just kind of takes off to do his own thing. It's Ellen that actually figures everything out by reading the book and putting the pieces together and saving the day by sacrificing yourself, which I think is pretty freaking amazing for a 1922 film to essentially have the female lead character as the hero of the story. All the men in the story were useless. They were useless and powerless. They could do nothing to stop Orlok. They were completely at his mercy. Oh, I should mention Renfield. How could I forget Renfield? That's another thing we're going to be taking a look at is the different Renfields over the years. There's a lot of fun to be had there. So in this one, they renamed him Knock. If you watched my thing about the uh, <coughs> Silent Screamers, you'll, uh, you may recall uh, that they called him Knock Renfield in the Silent Screamers collection. These are the action figures here. If you haven't uh, checked that out, go check that out uh, when you get a chance, if you feel so inclined. Um, I did a video all about setting the action figures up. And the cabinet of Dr. Caligari is off to the side there, which you can't see. But, um, yeah, so in this case, uh, Renfield, or Nock, is actually kind of Hutter's boss. And he's the one who initially sends him to Orlok to offer him the house. Now, in the book, he was just a crazy guy who fell under Dracula's inf influence. He had nothing to do with Harker or anything. He was just a crazy guy in the asylum that fell under Dracula, became Dracula's thrall, essentially. But in this one, it's a little bit different. Ren uh, Renfield Nock is the one who sends him to England. So, uh, And he's kind of off his rocker to begin with. You almost think that maybe he's already 
yeah, under the influence of Orlock, and this is all part of a uh, of a scheme that they've got going, or something like that, just to to bring him over there and get him more victims or what have you. But <clears throat> and then Knox uh, shortly afterwards goes nuts and is institutionalized. Um, and there, the I mean, his story plays out very similarly to Renfield from there there on, basically constantly climbing up to his window to 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 beckon to his master and and, and you know offering to do whatever he can, being under the promise of um, eternal life and such. Well, actually, he doesn't even. I don't think he, no, he doesn't even get that in this. He doesn't even get the promise of eternal life. He's just blindly loyal to Orlock and wants uh, wants to help him out any way he can. Uh, now, towards the end, he, he does escape from the asylum, and uh, there's a fun little chase scene where the villagers are trying to catch him and, and get him back. Uh, eventually, they do catch him and reinstitutionalize him, and he uh, is so connected to Orlok that he can actually sense when Orlok is killed by the sunlight. He knows when when his master has been destroyed. So it's quite interesting. So I guess I, I can't mention Nosferatu without talking about just some of the beautiful imagery in it. Um, it is such a stunning looking film. I, I, I love the use of shadows and, and I love the fact Max Shrek, I think, blinks once in the entire movie. Otherwise, he's just got his eyes wide open with that creepy, unblinking, unmoving stare. And he moves very slowly and very deliberately. Like all, all, it's a, quite a contrast to all the other actors who they they kind of do the typical, I guess you want to call it silent movie acting, where it's all very theatrical and and, and uh, exaggerated. But his performance is actually very subdued. Like he moves very slowly and deliberately, and it, it's it's it, it just adds to that creepy vibe. I love the use of shadows. I mean, there's that wonderful scene where he's going to Ellen and he, you just see the shadow of his hand reaching across the hall. I mean, you don't even see him. You just see his shadow. And then his shadow reaches across her chest and clenches over her heart. And as soon as he does that, she's like, oh, <laughs> like, like just his, his shadow alone has a, you know, physical power over, over her. It's, uh, it's quite striking. Uh, the, there's the shot I mentioned on the ship. Of course, there's a couple of shots on the ship. Actually, there's the one, it's a really low angled shot looking up at him as he's walking past the, uh, um, I guess the, the entrance to the cargo hold. And uh, oh, it's just some beautiful, beautiful shots. Now, apparently, out of the uh, you know ninety plus minutes of the movie, um, Orlock actually only appears on screen for about nine minutes. <laughs> so we don't technically see a lot of him, but boy, does he make an impression! Um, it's easy to see why uh, that look has been so influential. So Nosferatu, nineteen twenty-two fan freaking tastic and you know for an unofficial adaptation of dracula boy has it ever had a lasting impact on the lore now i just briefly have to mention the blu-ray releases um there's a there's a total at, at the time of this recording there's a total of five different blu-ray releases out this one here from kino is the only region a release everything else is region b and might i add region b locked so if you're not in Region B land and you want any of those releases, you'll need a region free player. Now the region the region I mentioned that, <laughs> the reason I mentioned that is because I hate to say this, but apparently the Kino version is the worst version out of all of them uh, in terms of the transfer. Now, in terms of the transfer quality, like the picture quality it looks great. It looks fantastic. But where they apparently messed it up was how they converted the frame rate of the original Film. I think the original film is like 18 frames per second and of course for the blu-ray they need to convert it to 24 now there is sort of an algorithmic ratio of um, you know speed versus duplicate frames and things like that that you can actually convert it evenly but apparently they did that improperly for the Kino release and as a result the frame rates a little bit jumpy at times so that said which of the releases you should get? Well, there's two. Apparently, the Masters of Cinema release is pretty much the best one. 
Um, so there's that one. Again, Regent B locked. And then I think the other one is the BFI release, British Film Institute uh, Blu-ray release. So those two apparently are the ones to get. Um, I don't have a ton of information about them. I found an article online a while back that compared the five releases uh, quite in depth. And for the life of me, I can't find it again. <laughs> I've been Google fooing like crazy and failing dismally to find it. So I do apologize. I would have included a link. But anyway, that's that's what I took away from that article. Basically, if you if you want the best of the best, go with the Masters of Cinema. I believe it's the 2006 restoration, which is the same one that this uses, but it's a better conversion of it. Um, the BFI one, I believe, is the 1995 restoration. They're both excellent restorations. There's just some slight differences in the color tinting. Uh, the 2006 version, I think, is a little more correct and logical. There's a few, or is it the other way around? I can't remember. There's, both of them have mistakes. Both of them are not perfect. But that said, they're very minor mistakes, and they're both excellent. So go with either one. Uh, and go with the Kino one for the extras. In terms of the extras here, what have we got here? We've got... Uh, uh, we've got the English and German intertitles version, which is quite nice. We've got uh, Hans, Hans Erdmann's original 1922 score, which is fantastic, by the way. It's a beautiful, beautiful score. Uh, much like how, if you ever saw my Metropolis review a few years back, it's much like that, where uh, hearing the original score with the film makes such a difference in the overall presentation. It's amazing. Uh, we got The Language of Shadows, which is a 52-minute 2007 documentary all about the making of Nosferatu, and lengthy excerpts from some other films by F.W. Murnau, such as Journey into the Night, The Haunted Castle, Phantom, The Finances of the Grand Duke, The Last Laugh, Tartuffe, Faust, and Taboo. Uh, most, if not all of which, are available from Kino. Alrighty, well that is it for this one. But it's not over for today. Yes, I've got two, count them, two more movie reviews coming your way today. And there's also a couple of video game videos too. There's one I think has already gone up, and there's another one going up later. So, yeah, five videos. Holy moly, I must be crazy. It's only October 1st. I don't know what I'm smoking, but uh, if you want some, let me know. I'll hook you up. No, just, just, just kidding. Um... Yeah, so we'll see you next time. So big thanks to you for watching. Big thanks to my Patreon sponsors. And until next time, sayonara. Greetings, everyone. Well, another Halloween season is upon us. So that means the Multimedia Chronicles is going into overdrive. That's right. Got a whole pile of movie reviews coming your way, lots of video game playthroughs, and plenty of other surprises. So let us begin at the beginning. Blah! <laughs> Uh, discovers Grapula. <laughs>